One more. Good morning. This is the Assembly Enterprise and Utility Oversight Committee meeting for August 16th, uh, 10 a.m. And we'll start with the roll call. Mr. Rivera. Felix Rivera. Dick Craig. Christopher Constant. Forrest Dunbar. Ira Perman. Thank you. It's the council. Thank you. Um, so we're going to have to switch the agenda just a little bit. And I'm on the phone, oh, Chris. Thanks, Amy. Um, because we don't quite have the resolution crafted, we're going to flip the order and take up the solid waste question first, and then we will get to that second. So hopefully that will be enough time to have the document prepared and then get a report from uh, MLMP. So why don't we... Uh, start with item B actually which is the unified billing for municipal utilities um, and I just wanted to bring this up I had a contact from a, a constituent who asked the question how do we get it so that I can go to one place and pay for all of my municipal utilities and I forwarded that off to uh, members of the administration and they said we are actually working on that and so uh, but they also said it is a much more complex question than uh, one would think so uh, be patient and uh, they aren't here to report on that but we will come back to that sometime in the future as the project develops so next we have a report from solid waste services a master plan and improvements and an update on the transfer station so take it away okay uh, Mark Spafford uh, general manager of solid waste services um, thanks for uh, let me speak here and present to you real quick so just because I don't want to dilly dally about why we are here the reason why we are here today is to introduce the concept of purchasing the adjacent to our facility Walmart property. Um, not to go too far into it just now because we're going to get into it further into the presentation, um, but just going through the master planning process that we started um, about eight months ago um, without having uh, the Walmart property really available as an alternative. Um, subsequent to starting the master plan, basically the Walmart property became available, and so we've tailored um, our master planning efforts to include a concept that looks at, um, in addition to uh, improving the existing transfer station uh, site, also looking at developing a new site at the Walmart property. Um, so just a little bit about me. I've been the general manager for two and a half years at SWS. Um, I've worked for the municipality for about five years now. I started at AWU o and um, I've got two kids here. My wife and I live here. I grew up here, went to East Anchorage High School, um, and you know, I'm a member of the community and really care about my job here. It's it's, it's cool being the at the top of the trash heap. You know, sometimes <laughs> some of the people say, you know, being it's there's no there's no cooler job than being the the head garbage man uh, in the community that I grew up in. So um, I, I really uh, appreciate all the support um, and, and help that the assembly members have provided over the years to the program. So we appreciate that. Basically. The theme of the presentation is we control our own destiny. And so when I was trying not to drink so much coffee this morning, you know, my other favorite drink happens to be uh, Wild Cherry Diet Pepsi. And I was kind of looking at that can and kind of thinking about how it related back to like everything that we're doing um, at the utility and kind of what, what the point of the master planning effort was. And, and basically the question that we're trying to answer with the master plan is how do we increase the life of the landfill for as long into the future as possible? And frankly, the only way to do that is to keep materials out of it because we're kind of blessed with a natural resource, um, which is the landfill space that we have right now. But basically, the point that I want to try to make is that every bit of material that we divert from the landfill helps to extend that life ultimately. And so I think today we don't really want to get caught up in the, the fact of, you know, are we subsidizing recycling? Does it cost more to recycle versus just throwing in the landfill? Because that might be the case today. However, in the future, when the landfill fills up and we have nowhere else to go, the cost to do something with our garbage is going to increase exponentially. And so it's better for us uh, to be proactive and, and set up and tailor ourselves to divert as much material from the landfill as possible. And so, one thing that I wanted to point out, which is what kind of these, this was the stack uh, of paperwork that was done as part of the, the solid waste master plan that was done over 30 years ago. But basically what came out of that is build the transfer station and build where the landfill's at right now, which is, you know, off Highland Road. Um, but as you can see, they did a pretty thorough alternatives analysis of where to site the, where to site the uh, existing landfill. Um, and as you can see from this map, 
Um, some of the other sites that they had located within a municipality aren't really sites that we would consider, um, <laughs> they, weren't even, they weren't even really applicable back then, um, let alone like kind of what they are now. Like I don't think anybody wants to see the new landfill going to Kincaid Park. I don't think the same thing goes for uh, you know uh, the Campbell track. And I, for one, happen to be an Anchorage, uh, a Southwest Anchorage resident who lives in West Park where the Sand Lake pits are. I know for sure that I'm not gonna recommend that they stick a landfill in the neighborhood where I live at right now. And so basically the, the point of this is that after ARL, after the landfill is filled, there is nowhere else for us to go except barging it to Seattle or someplace outside of the municipality. And so because of the importance um, that, the, that the landfill plays to us, um, to, the, to the community, and all of our constituents, all of our residents, is we've developed a kind of landfill, I like to call it the doomsday clock. And so it's, it's a clock that we have on our webpage um, that we're able to basically go on there and kind of see what the life of the landfill is at that very moment. And this, this, uh, this widget right here takes into account all of the operational <coughs> parameters that we're measuring every day, like how much we're recycling, how much waste is being generated, as well as how we're doing operationally at the landfill with placing garbage. And so all this kind of rolls up into that, that end of life calculator for the landfill. And so what you can see is if, you know, everybody in the community started recycling those one cans that they're throwing away every day instead of putting in the recycling bin, you know, we can see if we, if we extended that out and people did their job of recycling their cans, you could extend the life out a couple of years. If everyone in the community had curbside recycling, which is about 25% the waste generated, you can see what it does to the landfill life. If everyone in the community started diverting organic waste, you know, food scraps and yard waste, you can see what it would do to the life of the facility. If, if we started doing something even more innovative, whereas we were, say, uh, a mass burn facility where we were converting our, our garbage into energy, you could reduce the mass of the garbage going to the, to the landfill by over 90%, and you see what that does to the length of the, uh, the life of the landfill. Or if you get to zero waste, of course, it's infinity at that point, um, and that's kind of the best case scenario. But that's what we're trying. That's what we're aspiring to get to. And so that this is our existing facility. Um, this is the existing transfer station. So this is this is the admin facility. This is the existing tipping floor. Um, here's the household hazardous waste facility, and then this is basically. Um, off of English Street, off of 54th, is where our, our traffic gets queued up, and whereas I'm sure you guys have heard from some of your constituents about, and maybe even experienced it yourselves, right, about how long it can take sometimes and how confusing it is to get in and out of our facility. So the interesting thing is, is we purchased this property in 2006. Um, this was the original transfer station property, um, and essentially because Walmart had purchased this property, you know, 2000, I think it was 2004, 2005, we had anticipated there being a large influx of traffic coming in, so we, to try to protect ourselves and give us a method for better queuing traffic, we purchased this property to help us stack up traffic inside of our facility versus having it be on the road or having it impact commercial traffic out here that was coming in and out of what was gonna be the, the new Walmart facility. And so the reason why to look at the transfer station, we have. We have two extremely, we have two very important assets at the utility. One is the landfill and the other is the transfer station. The transfer station is important to us because 80% of the solid waste that's generated in the community comes across that floor first. Um, so basically, it's, it's literally located in the middle of town um, and all, of eight, like I said, 80% of the garbage comes there, um, gets disposed of there, and we haul it out to the landfill and bury it. But what we've noticed over time is that, um, you know, the facility in, in some cases is over 40 years old, some parts of it, because it, it was an existing shredder plant before it got uh, converted into a transfer station. So some, some components of it are 40 years old and the majority of the facility is over 30 years old. So as you can imagine, you know, I'm, I'm 40 now, but it might not be old to everyone. I do know that a lot of the things on me don't work as well as they used to, you know, when I was a younger man. But if you think about it, the transfer station gets beat up every single day that it's open. It has, it's a heavy industrial facility. It's got large garbage trucks going over there every day. Um, large, you know, thousands of vehicles coming to that facility, um, you know, every month from residences, you know, several hundred every day of commercial vehicles. And so it's taken a beating over the years. 
Another, uh, uh, one of the big points that we wanted to evaluate as part of um, this master planning effort was the safety concerns that we have. Now if you notice, and we'll, we'll have another picture of it later, but what we have in the transfer station, and you can see that's a, this is a very bright and sunny day, um, and this is inside of the transfer station, you can see how dark it is, and what that is, is that's a person that's standing behind a truck that's emptying, you know, that's kind of, you know, concealed by a large pile of trash, and that's like an everyday occurrence, and there's nothing that we can really do operationally to avoid any of that. So we have near misses with customers that aren't following all of our, you know, rules about using the facility, you know, people get sidetracked and do things that are not supposed to, like go and start digging through garbage that's on the, the tipping floor. Um, and so that could lead to people being not where they're supposed to be. And when you have a 100,000 pound loader that's going back and forth, pushing garbage into the, into the loading pits, you know, you can, you can come close and have, you know, lots and lots of your misses. And the last thing that we want to do um, is ever harm or injure anyone um, as part of our operations. And just to note, if you, if you don't already know this, you know, the solid waste industry is one of the top five most dangerous businesses, um, you know, in the United States. And so it's a very dangerous, uh, it's a very congested facility with a lot of stuff going on in there, and so we have lots of near misses. And so safety is a big concern for us. Another option, another thing that we look at is um, we just have limited space, and so we have limited options for diversion potential. And so when you're coming back to thinking about, well, how do we improve the life of the landfill, we have limited options um, at the existing transfer station site to do things like segregating tires, um, taking you know, mattresses out of the waste stream, doing a better job with metals recycling, doing a better job with, with having places of, for people to separate out um, you know, yard waste and food waste and stuff like that. And then of course, you know, the thing that, that I hear about the most in my position, more so than even bear resistant uh, you know, containers or carts, is uh, traffic. And so what people don't, what people really do not like is having to get into the transfer station line and they're stuck there and then they're waiting there for you know, what could be one hour to two hours, just depending on, you know, how fast people are loading and how fast people are, or how bad traffic is stacked up at the facility. And so, again, this just comes back to safety and lack of opportunities. What, what you can see here is that, again, it's just, even on the most well-lit days in Alaska, we still have a dark facility inside just because the lighting's poor, um, how the building faces doesn't allow itself to have good lighting inside. Also. It's just covered in soot from you know 30 years of heavy diesel traffic going in and out of that place, and so it just it, it's very dark in there, and sometimes it can be very difficult for um, for operators to see what's going on in the facility. Um, and this this is kind of a this was really interesting when I started working there, but this is our household hazardous waste facility um, at the transfer station, and basically these are two rail carts that you know some very creative and ingenuitive people before me. Uh, converted into the actual reuse store and where the where hazardous household hazardous waste was, was uh, going to be accepted. But these are these are troop carriers that they used in World War II, and so they're from the you know the circa 1930s and 40s, and we've got lots of issues. And basically, what this is is this is paint that's been stacked up from a real busy day during the summer with nowhere to go, just sitting in the parking lot to further congesting it. And then, of course, I like to show the lone paint trash can. Uh, just because we have lots of materials that we have to stage outside. It's not a good idea to keep, you know, roll carts and dumpsters from an unenclosed area. And we just have limited options for, again, segregating materials that we can easily take out of the waste stream if we had some place to better, to better stage those. Uh, another issue and of course, you know, the building is 30 to 40 years old, and so we've got, you know, aging HVAC units like on the top of top right hand corner we've got you know boilers that we need to replace which is in the bottom left corner which somehow they built the building around the boilers and so we're essentially going to have to tear out tear down the building to get those old boilers out to put the boilers in um, and the picture on the bottom right is a structural member that's holding uh, the roof of the transfer station floor that is basically bent now at a 70 degree angle um, just because of all the wear and tear and from vehicles hitting it over the years and so the building the buildings, the infrastructure there is just old. And so, again, back to what we're introducing to you all today. So, that, so the benefits of building on the Walmart property, let me just scroll through here. Yeah. And, and those are the, it's, it's essentially six parcels. Um, 
with with two here and four there, and it's about uh, you know 27 acres that we're looking at purchasing. And so the benefits of building on this site versus doing something here, I mean, there's there's a lot of benefits actually. One thing is is that as we're kind of learning right now is that to really do any kind of um, appreciable infrastructure improvement on our existing site, we have to close it down. And so right now, we're just replacing the tipping floor and our facility is gonna be closed for three to four weeks. And so basically what that means is that, you know, the three to 400 commercial customers that we have every day, as well as, you know, the on peak days, we have over a thousand people coming to a residential side of facilities. Basically all that traffic has to go out to the landfill if they want to dispose of something. So what that does, is that obviously if people have to drive longer, that increases costs. So especially for our commercial customers, right? So whereas Alaska Waste could do three loads a day, you know, their normal eight hour day like we do now because the central, the transfer station is located in the middle of town, what's gonna happen is, is during that same time period, they're only gonna be able to get two loads a day done. And so what that means is they're gonna have to rebalance their routes or hire more people to get the same amount of work done because they're gonna have to spend two to three hours every day uh, doing a round trip out to the landfill. And so that means millions of dollars to all of our commercial customers, which is very important because that that cost will basically come back on all of your constituents because they're gonna they're gonna make up their money one way or the other. And so that's and, and that amounts to millions of dollars a year. Uh, additionally shutting down the transfer station, we have a ten dollar per ton surcharge that we charge on every load that comes across the, the scale here at the transfer station. So if you say 80% of the, of the waste that's coming in starts at the transfer station, that equates to like two and a half to $3 million a year of lost revenue. And to do what we need to do um, to improve our existing transfer station site, is, that would basically mean, you know, according to our, our engineer and our, our consultants at Tetra Tech, is that we'd have to shut the facility down for two, if not three years to get the improvements done. And so as a customer service focused entity, that's really the last thing that we want to do. I, and I think as, as I think that's the last thing your constituents would want as well, is for us to have to close down the facility for two or three years if we have a good option. But basically what, what the new facility allows us to do is we can lay out the perfect transfer station to do all of those things that we need it to do, such as separate the little people from the big yellow equipment. And so we could have a space where residential customers are able to dispose of the material away from uh, large commercial customers, which will be a big benefit in improvement and safety. Um, another benefit is, uh, is when we do vacate, if and when we do vacate this property, this leaves open um, at least this portion of our facility for other uses by the municipality, which for instance, this could be used as a grid facility, which there's a need for a regional disposal facility for grid that's coming out of our stormwater system. This could be used as another warm storage um, location for any of our other municipal departments that have needs for additional space, such as you know, acreage water and wastewater utility, uh, maintenance and operations fleet, anything like that. So it's not like we would just have to tear down this facility and sell off the property. There's a beneficial use for it um, down the road. But again, the, the main point of purchasing this property is that it allows us to control our own destiny. We're not gonna have to close down the facility for two to three years to do the improvements that we need and we're able to lay out the facility like a transfer station instead of what we kind of had scabbed together over here. So granted, we've done an excellent job of, of using that as a transfer station facility, um, but we can do better. Thank you, a couple of questions. <clears throat> and is it possible you present this slideshow to the clerk so we can share it by email? Uh, email to them. Oh yeah, yeah, absolutely. Thank you. Uh, okay, Mr. Trainee. We looked at a sorting station. Seattle has one. I've been down there and looked at it. Well, they sort the material coming in. So you've got reusable put to one side. It's very efficient. Have we looked at putting that on the Walmart property? That's that's the vision, frankly, is like that. That's what we would have available um, to our customers and your constituents. Is we would have those options available for them to, um, you know, you could sort whatever the materials that we like metals. You could have yard waste and organic waste. You could have. You know, mattresses are a big problem. Tires are like my pet peeve because you can't you can't compact a tire at all, and so it just it just takes up space, and they're all over the place. And so if we could have a way to better sort those so that they're not going into the waste stream, that's a big improvement for us because that comes back again to being able to save more airspace at the landfill and keep it open longer. I spent a day down with Seattle going through that operation. 
would be good if we plan for that on this property because it's a fish away to divert the products from having to go to landfill that don't need to go there. Yeah, I've been meaning to go there too, so it's, it's worth taking a trip to then. Please go to it. Yeah. It's amazing. Now coming into the uh, the uh, site we've got right now, you have every, diverting everybody to 54, but that's only because the restaurants complained about everybody coming in front of them to get to the, and I get nothing but complaints from people, why don't we go the way we used to get there instead of the 54th. That was a political decision I think made by the Southern Administration. Not that proper with my constituents. So, so for the record, Mr. Croft has joined us, and uh, so next in the queue is Mr. Dunbar. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, so just looking at these, the size of these properties, and I'm just eyeballing it because there's not an acreage on the current transfer site, but it looks like the 16.5 acres at the bottom is about the same size. And, you know, if we were to purchase that, we would still have the old transfer site area available for, like you said, whatever we choose to use it. So my question is, why are we buying both properties? And is there a way to just buy one, or is Walmart basically saying you have it's to buy It's the whole one? package. So. And so what I, what I forgot, what I forgot, I was getting too excited property. talking about it, but what I forgot to mention yeah, is that basically the new transfer station would be sited on this on these four parcels yeah these two parcels would be would remain undeveloped and so there's a lot of potential that we could use those properties for you know even if we don't do anything related to solid waste management on those properties we can subdivide them and sell them at some point if we're not able to sure. come up with something to use those for but what what i would envision those for yeah. is is again that mass burn facility you know you have some other kind of waste to energy facility there um, that's in its size for that too. So if we wanted to do that at some point in the future, that's something that we could consider and that property would be a perfect place for it. Yeah, I, I, I see that. I, I mean, I think that the municipality also owns quite a lot of land and we obviously want to avoid purchasing land that we might not need or use, especially if there's some commercial owner that has it right now that could sell it for something else. And so, I mean, I guess I'm just curious how how resistant Walmart is, or are they, they basically say it's totally off the table that we buy the bottom parcel, not the top parcel. Yeah, I mean, it wasn't even an option to not, to not have all I mean, that. is it is it some, am I missing something? Is there, is it, but it is like divided, right? I and mean, they are different plots, right, or whatever, yeah. parcels. I mean, because it looks like there's a road that runs between there's, them. That's just a, that's, right that's away. like a right away, right. that's just not, doesn't have anything. Okay. All right, Mr. Perman. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, very enthusiastic uh, for the presentation. Uh, very clear. Thank you. Uh, I'm a regular user of the uh, Central Transfer Station. I'm meaning like two, three times a year. Here, we use coupons. I take advantage of that. Um, we're always taking, you know, whatever. That's sir, that's mine. Oh. And uh, I can attest to that that facility gets very crowded, uh, very heavily used. And as far as the safety issues, they are very real. I mean, I'm always when I'm throwing stuff out of the back of my vehicle, you have to be very careful, you know, not to hit the guy in the big... Uh, the loader operator. The loader operator. I wouldn't want that job. That's, That's the, that literally is the hardest job um, at the utility. Yeah. Is that job, just because of all the dangers associated. It's very dangerous. Uh, thanks also for having the, 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 the household hazardous waste uh, disposal site there. It's wonderful for us. Uh, also a place where you can actually take uh, oil when you change your oil and drop it off there. All good stuff. Um, question, uh, are we going to hear about how this might get paid for? Yeah, would you yes. go back two slides or three slides? One more. There. Thank you. Okay. Um, Two really questions. What are the pink trash cans for? I'm starting to see this pop up. The, the pink roll carts are for um, it's a it's part of our pilot program for yard waste and food scraps diversion from our residential customers. Okay, it has been popping up in my neighborhood and didn't know if they were. And do you have a, a 17 inch rim a, a tire carcass like this? <laughs> 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 anyway. All right. Any other Still questions? Scavenging at our facility, yeah. sir. <laughs> okay, so I hear no other questions. I do have a couple. Um, you know, looking at the layout of the land, Mark, are you intending, Mark, are you I'm intending sorry. any redundancy there? And so far as in the future, if we need to close down the transfer station, that we can only close down part of it and it could still function? 
that's the difficult part with doing the large scale refurbishments that we need mm -hmm. is that once you when you start messing with one side of it it kind of impacts the whole facility um, itself right so, so it's, it's not it's not really it doesn't it doesn't lend itself towards having safe uh, efficient operations to to like close down certain parts of it to do something with it. that's the current paradigm but if you get Correct. this new land and you have an expansion and a redesign will you be building in a redundant method to operate so that you don't have to cost every utility utilizer and commercial customer millions of dollars because of a, a known update yeah and this is this is just a conceptual plan um, and again assuming that you know if and when we get approval to move forward with this we would you know during the design process you know, of course take like every effort to make sure that we have redundancy um, to keep people from having to go out to the landfill as much as possible I mean just having uh, updated and newer facilities will lend itself towards you know that not really being a concern for a long period of time Okay, and then um, the question of how it would be funded, is this something that would come out of the solid waste capital kind of funding their own revenues, or is this something that would be funded from It would come out of our revenue. Um, and so we would do a, where's Ross? Where's Ross? So Ross, this might be a good time for, did you want to come up and present the, do you, you want to hear about the we, finance? We have like maybe yeah. two minutes, okay. but yes. So yeah, we would, we would work with public finance to uh, do a short-term uh, loan fund, or a short-term loan program. Uh, to do the uh, to, to purchase the land to do the construction we would pay that debt and then obviously when not obviously but when we put the facilities into service we would do a long-term revenue bond uh, to, to pay for those to pay for those improvements all right so I imagine we'll have work session on the topic once we get to a concrete proposal yeah correct and that's so that that's kind of what's the, the next steps are this gets put in front of you you know so I think the meeting on September 11th um, goes to the public hearing on the meeting after that on the 25th, and then we have a work session, uh, you know, whatever that is, the Friday before the 21st, where we would we would answer whatever questions you have, give a much more detailed um, you know presentation about the options that we considered, as well as the financing and what that's going to look like as far as our rates are concerned. Thank you. Last question, Mr. Train. Please reach out to the affected community councils, because if Absolutely. you don't, they'll come to the meeting screaming. So reach out to them ahead of time, please. Absolutely. Thank you. All right. So uh, the next item on the agenda is the first item, and that's conversation about the sale of MLNP to Chugash Electric. And I'm sorry we had to delay you. Are we ready? We don't have a draft. Okay. So um, I am sorry to report that we don't have our drafted resolution yet to be introduced, but we have two weeks essentially to get it ready and into the record. So. Um, when we have that ready, it's possible that we will set up a special meeting, a short half hour special meeting, just to go over the item. And uh, it's my fault for not following through. Uh, and <clears throat> I'm really hopeful to hear a report from both the administration and from Chugash now about where we stand in the negotiations as far as you can talk about. And I uh, want to take the floor. Lee. Mr. Chairman, thank you. I'm Lee Fever with, with Chugach Electric, and I can tell you that the last time we met, um, we were concerned with getting data and, and getting this thing moved on. That was the reason that our board of directors looked at putting the resolution together to make sure that everybody's kind of feet were held to the fire to make sure we got the data. What I can tell you today is the data has come. Um, I think we've got over 13,000 pieces of data in the data room right now. We've got what we need to move forward with our due diligence, and I think we're making excellent progress on the negotiations with, with our term sheet. I think we're down to maybe just one or two items to try to tweak, and we'll have that finalized. Um, we have a draft asset purchase agreement put together, which we should get to the municipality within um, this week. I think that'll be the big part of, of moving this process forward. Um, we've been working on integration. We talked before about the integration management office that we have. We've been working with the employees at MLMP. We've finished kind of the administration side of things, you know, purchasing and, and those types of things. Now we're moving into the operating areas and, and starting to work with those groups. And the whole idea of the integration management office is making sure how we take these two organizations and move them into one when the actual sale goes through. So there's a lot of work that's being done ahead of time 
so we are ready to, to make that move once, once the sale goes through at closing. Um, we've got our investment banking team on board, so we're, we've got all the finances that we're working on, making sure that when we get to closing, we'll have the financing deal in place, um, so that's well underway. Um, we have three labor agreements where we're taking all of MLMP's employees into our three individual bargaining units. Um, we have two agreements that are tentatively agreed to. We're down to one or two items on the last one. We hope to have that done here this week. Um, our due diligence um, efforts are well underway. I think we're, we're very far along with the, the environmental, and then we're continuing on just to look at the facilities to make sure that what we're buying is actually there. Um, we're not concerned with that, it's just a process um, that we're going through. Um, to give you some idea on timeline, um, we have a work session with our board of directors on August 29th and 30th. We'll kind of lay out exactly where we're at, keep them up to speed, because we do have a board meeting on September 24th, and that's where I think we'll try to lay out um, the asset purchase agreement, what all the final details are, and then we anticipate taking October 24th would be the timeline for our board to actually make their decision and approve um, the asset purchase agreement. Um, so we think we're well well into the timeline. We think negotiations and all of the, the real work is, is going very, very well and progressing. And with that, Mr. Chairman, I take any questions you may have. Questions? Just one question. Mr. Dunbar. So, uh, and I guess this is a question for our attorney as well as yours. Um, you're going to present the hopefully finalized, but perhaps not, asset purchase agreement to the board on the 24th. Right, right. right. And then have a vote on the on October 24th. So September 24th, they, they see it. October 24th, they vote. My question is, you know, we have thir the December 31st is our um, deadline, and, and we have certain processes we have to go through. Can we have it introduced in the interim, or do we need to wait until your board has, has actually approved it before we can have an ordinance or a resolution or whatever the actual legal uh, uh, vehicle is introduced at the assembly? Through the chair, Mr. Hump, Mr. Dunbar, that might be a question for your attorney. Mr. Falls, um, yeah. it's, it's something where... That would be something, and I'm hoping Mr. Falls can give a report when we're done with questioning I, Mr. Thiebert, right so... He's my <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> We'll think through that. I, uh, typically, when we bring all contract instruments to the assembly, we typically have the signature from the countervailing party on already on heat. And then we say, this is the agreement, here are the material terms. Yeah. Can we sign it? Um, because this one is of such high interest, we, we could do something a little different where we sort of say, sort of the parties to the agreement being simultaneously reviewed for final signature for the full size. I don't know. We have just, I'm just thinking about this. I, I don't have it in front of me. Just thinking about the schedule of meetings, um, and you know, this is not something I want to drop. I wouldn't want to lay this on the table or even have it on an addendum. I want some item there for the public to see on the regular agenda. And if that requires us to have an unsigned ordinance, essentially, or unsigned document, that then we could sub that in. But it's been on, sitting on the regular agenda, so people can see it. I think that would be important. It's just trying to be cognizant that. It seems like you know we have after this is passed, we'll have about a little over two months to, to get it passed at the assembly. And that seems like a long, long, a lot of time, but it, you know that time could evaporate, especially since we're in the middle of our budget cycle. So I just wanted to be cognizant of that. Thank you, Mr. Johnson. Thank you. And so I think that for next month's agenda, Lisa, we add um, at least a review of what the board presents. If we're that late in the month, if we're earlier in the month, then uh, maybe again a special meeting get to the two week benchmark that we discussed before. Yeah. Go ahead, Mr. Trini. Lee, have you identified excess property that you don't want to get? We are actually we're having a through the chair, Mr. Trini, we are having a meeting um, this afternoon to talk about what we found through the process that we have gone through, have an inventory of what's there. What I haven't, what I can't tell you right now is what we don't want, and we'll have a meeting this afternoon. So maybe at the next meeting, I'll have a better idea for you. If you could bring the next meeting just a list of what you don't want, okay. I'd appreciate that because we have other uses for property. Absolutely. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you. So um, then, next up, Mr. Falsey, oh, from your where sorry. you stand, tell us more. Oh, okay. Solid kudos to what you said. I'm very encouraged by the progress last year. We've addressed. 
driving around here to install of our various substations and we'll be pivoting to the plants this week, next week. Uh, so the new building seems to be well underway. We've been meeting weekly and sometimes more than weekly, Mondays and for Thursdays, to really drive the negotiations to a conclusion. I think we've seen very substantial progress in the last few weeks and we're in church where we're at now. We have another meeting this afternoon and uh, we're making very good progress. All right, so Mr. Gates. Um, yeah, I just want to speak to the time issue and uh, this ordinance we be set out on the municipal twenties for example. So I would have to go forward to whatever they say. But in terms of timing, it seems to me uh, we have an assembly meeting October twenty third, uh, right before the two batches uh, board meeting on the twenty fourth. I don't see any reason the old ordinance couldn't be drafted in uh, close to final form and introduced at the 23rd meeting except for public three uh, and uh, the first or second meeting in November and you have time then to do an version or submit an AIM with the final, um, I guess, uh, purchase agreement and you have the rewards resolution after they pass it on the 24th and so forth. You could add that in afterwards and for the public three. I think that timing would be okay. Okay, and I believe Mr. Dunbar, you're next in the queue. You are, I'm fine, thank you. All right, any other questions? No, so um, what, I, what I had said before Mr. Traney started talking is that previously we had discussed as we, no, it's all right. We had previously discussed at some point we imagined we would start to move this committee meeting to every other week as things get more serious. And so as we get closer and closer, and so I think we're probably getting close to that time and uh, so for the purposes of the resolution that I would like to have us pass at our next meeting, it seems like we should have another meeting uh, before the 28th. And so where we can have that in review and get it introduced onto the agenda so that we communicate in good faith to their board for their meeting on the following day. And so um, that I think is something I'm gonna work with Mr. Traney to figure out. We can work on it. All right, so any other questions or comments? Nope. Uh, thank you all for your hard work. Um, getting goosebumps. We're getting close. And uh, this is the future. So thank you. I guess on that, we'll adjourn. Thank you. Oh, oh, yeah. Audience participation. Please. Thank you, Mr. Tony, for ensuring we follow the process. What's your name, sir? PowerPoint, yeah, a slideshow. Yeah, and uh, unfortunately, uh, I was trying to get a copy of it. And it would appreciate any assistance I can get a copy of that. And that's all I have to say. And thank you very much. Thank you. And I think that uh, just as a matter of response to that, we heard a member of this body state exactly that we want to make sure this gets on the regular agenda in as much time as possible for the public to have input. So that's the point of the meeting. Yeah, thank can you. I just one question. I wasn't clear to, with all due respect, on the same subject on the uh, last item a proposed date that was the assembly attorney was saying i couldn't uh, uh, see was he proposing certain dates of when this would go through the or, solid waste question or no the excuse me thank you for clarification did you get to municipal light and power issue we're working out the timelines now it would be sometime after october 24th but before the end of the year okay thank you for the clarification yep all right any other Public comment? Hearing none, and this meeting is adjourned.